Hi, welcome to my show. Thank you for spending time with me today. I want you to get dividends on that investment in time, so think about some takeaways for you. Today we'll be talking about what's in your food. I'm going to highlight some food additives that I think you should look for and try to avoid in your diet. And then we're going to make a nice recipe of what I like to call truly chewy. So they're little dessert treats that are healthy. There's no artificial ingredients added to them. So we'll get to that in just a little bit. The first thing that I wanna to mention to you is that there are some really good resources that you can look to to learn more about what's in your food. One is the Environmental Working Group, so that's ewg.org. And the other that I like is CSPI, Center for Science in the Public Interest. And then if you can Google Chemical Cuisine, and they have lots of great information. It's almost like a dictionary of food additives. And then this is another source that I use. This is Ruth Winter's Consumers uh, Dictionary of Food Additives. And I found this to be helpful as well. And then I also use the FDA site and look up food additives regularly in there to see what the real deal is, what's really going on, what's allowed, what isn't allowed. So that's a nice resource to use as well. Now, I wanted to chat with you about the microbiome. And you might have started to hear about this a bit. So the microbiome is basically the genes of the ecosystem of the microorganisms that inhabit your body, primarily in your intestines. And what I find is that a lot of people refer to the microbiome as the, the intestines or uh, the, sorry, the bacteria in your intestines and the balance of that bacteria. You probably have heard there's good and bad bacteria in the intestines. What I find fascinating is that they are now doing research into food additives and how food additives may be affecting the microbiome. So if you just have some intestinal discomfort, you might think about first line of defense, just trying to avoid artificial colors, additives, preservatives in the diet, and some of the other ingredients that we'll talk about, and then see how you feel, if you feel a lot better after, after doing that. So let's, um, let me go back to the microbiome for a moment. If we think about our intestines, we want to have that good bacteria, and we really want to lessen the bad bacteria. And one of the things that protects the intestines is a mucosal lining. So we find that some food ad additives may be negatively affecting that mucosal lining, and we'll talk more about that. Um, one of the items that may be troublesome is emulsifying agents. And emulsifying agents, they may contribute to obesity and inflammation by affecting that mucosal layer. And that was reported in the Journal of Nature in 2015. Now, what are emulsifiers anyway? So they are used to stabilize products, to make them more consistent. So if you think about uh, salad dressing, how salad dressing, if you look at them now and you, you, you go to the supermarket, you'll see they look pretty even throughout. And that's because emulsifiers help to hold the oil and the water together and make it look like a more stabilized product. You'll find emulsifiers in ice cream, cakes, creamers, lots of different foods. Um, junk foods, energy bars. One big one is lecithin. We'll talk more about that in just a little bit. You'll see polysorbate 60 and 80, diglycerides, uh, uh, monoglycerides. These are, are emulsifiers. So we'll um, chat about lecithin today and then some of the others we'll go over it at in probably another show because we have um, just a short bit of time today and I just want to highlight a few things. So lecithin, why do you see that in your foods? Why so many foods? Um, well, many foods carry it because, again, it holds water and fat together and also can give texture and it can reduce the clumpiness of powders. So I find that kind of interesting because some of the additives come in powder form and then they need to add the soy lecithin to reduce that clumping of the powder. And it kind of reminds me of when you take a medicine, then you have side effects, you have to take another medicine for that medicine. So let's just try to avoid the food additives, then we won't need to reduce that clumping of powders if we're not using a powder. Um, now, where are we finding soy lecithin? Well, energy bars, um, some almond milks, um, con other confections, baked goods, margarine, um, also in dairy products. 
And my problem with soy lecithin and with some of um, some other ingredients is that they may be using the, the food company's hexane to extract soy protein, so soy protein isolates and oils um, from seeds and this lecithin from, uh, from the soy bean. Now, um, what is hexane? Well, it's actually found in jet fuel and gasoline. Can you imagine? And there really haven't been a lot of studies on, on the effects, so I believe that we are the lab rats. There have been studies on the inhalation effects, and for humans, it causes nervous system malfunction, numbness in extremities, muscle weakness, blurred vision and fatigue. In rats, neurotoxicity, um, and lesions in the respiratory tract. And it's actually known as a hazardous air pollutant by the EPA, but we're actually using it to extract ingredients from beans and seeds. So that worries me a little bit. So what's in your energy bar? You know, check it out, see if this is in there. Now, how do we get around this? Well, if we buy organic, then that's a you know, good way to know that, all right, they're not using hexane. So let's just look at a couple of um, items here. So these are Cheez-Its, and we look at Cheez-Its, soy lecithin is in here. And then we look at potato chips. So you see I'm holding up a lot of junk food, but it's not just junk food, soy lecithin in here. And then we look at M&Ms. And besides all the food coloring, there is um, soy lecithin in here. And then we look at another junky item, the Oreos. And again, we see the soy lecithin. So it's in a lot of products. And it's just something, again, you want to, if it is in your food, you want to make sure that um, it's organic. And I'm starting to notice, I was in a uh, natural food store and I was looking at the coconut oils and I noticed that one of them said hexane free. Um, so that's good that, it, that we know that hexane wasn't used um, in the processing of that, of that product. All right, let's um, move on from there and talk about texturizers and, and thickeners. So these can be used to thicken or add texture to, to products, and one of them is carrageenan or carrageenan. I've heard it pronounced both ways. And this is made from seaweed um, and Irish moss. And in animal tests, it's been found to be harmful to the colon and may cause intestinal inflammation. And if your kids go to school, this is in the chocolate milk, some of the chocolate milk that I've looked at anyway. So it's a little scary that, um, you know, that, that this is out there and can be causing some dis discomfort. Where else do we see it? Ice cream, candy, other processed foods, chocolate products. So you want to, you know, take a look at what you're eating and, um, and see if that's in there. And you might want to avoid that one. Now, another one that's kind of interesting is maltodextrin. And I remember for years reading this when I was a kid in labels growing up. And that's a texturizer. And in the Journal of Gut Microbes, what it found is that it may decrease the mucosal barrier defense. So again, affecting that mucus layer that protects your intestines, and it promotes E. coli strain adhesion. Who wants that? Definitely not me. So you want to think about looking in your labels and try to avoid the maltodextrin. And, you know, I'm going to just sneak out a salad dressing here. And when I look at this salad dressing, there is maltodextrin in there. Now, I was um, on a, a plane ride recently, and I was heading out to a conference, and I was reading my notes about maltodextrin, and literally like five minutes later, they come along and ask, you know, if you want a snack, and it was peanuts. And I thought, oh, great, peanuts. And then I get them, and I look, and there's maltodextrin in there. Now, peanuts are an excellent snack. They're really healthy for you. But why throw in the maltodextrin? We don't really need that. Um, so that's one of them that I think, you know, if you can avoid it, that would be nice, nice to do. Another ingredient I like to move on to is actually two ingredients, nitrates and nitrites. These are in your processed meats. They're in cold cuts. You want to look at hot dogs. Uh, look at the label because these are associated with cancer. We want to try to to avoid these. So if you're doing sandwich meats, what about getting a rotisserie chicken instead? I love at Whole Foods, they have really nice chickens there that, um, that you can get, you know, roasted chicken and have that. And, it, you know, in other supermarkets, you can find roasted turkey breast too. 
And that's a much better option than getting that deli cut meat in the regular supermarket because you, you get in trouble with the, the nitrates and the nitrites. Um, someone had a question in one of my classes and they said, well, what about turkey bacon? So I said, you know, I'm not too sure. I looked it up and in some companies, some brands, there is sodium nitrite in the turkey bacon. So you have to check your labels. Now, another one that's sneaky is propyl paraben. And when I first read about this one being harmful, I read about an environmental group put out in 2014. Um, they put the dirty dozen food additives. And when I looked at, you know, which ones they listed, propyl paraben was listed. And I tried to find it in the labels at the supermarket and I couldn't find it, but then I did find it in one product that was in tortilla. Um, so look in your tortillas and this was in a corn tortilla in the, the um, international part of the, the supermarket. And I, you know, just felt really bad that it was in there because it may impair fertility, may speed up the growth of breast cancer cells. Um, so a lot of people might not know that. And maybe you don't eat tortillas, but the other thing that it's in, food coloring. Food coloring is in so many foods. I mean, there's one healthier jelly brand that I thought was a healthier brand. And I noticed that in their mint jelly, there's food coloring. We, we don't need food coloring in there. You know what's scary too? Sometimes they add food coloring to dog and cat food. I mean, why do we need to do that to our pets? Um, so let's, um, let's move on a bit. So remember this propyl paraben is in food coloring. So we want to try to avoid uh, artificial food coloring if we can. Now the next two I want to chat about are BHA and BHT. These are associated with cancer. They're banned in other countries, banned, but we use them here. Now one of them um, is in a cereal product that I have here. And when you look in the label, you'll see BHT for freshness. Um, it doesn't say BHT for cancer because then people probably wouldn't eat it, but I think it would be great to get people off of the BHT and the BHA. Now, where do you find them? Lots of processed foods. Um, I even see it in oatmeal packets, so you wanna be careful what kind of oatmeal you're getting. I like to get the old fashioned oats. I love, 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 love one ingredient foods. Oatmeal, one ingredient, oats in there. All right, now, so the BHA, BHT um, chips, you can find it in um, vegetable oils, um, crackers, chewing gum. We're going to talk more about chewing gum in, in a moment and some popular crackers that are out there too. So you do want to check your, your label. All right. Another one that was on the, uh, dirty dozen food additive list of environmental working group was propyl gallate. And this is a preservative associated with stomach and skin irritation and associated with cancer in rats. Now, where do we find it? Well, products that contain fats like sausage, lard, and may be an ingredient in gum base. Wait till I tell you what's in gum base. Take a look. If you chew gum, pull out your gum. And you're probably going to find that it has an ingredient called gum base. Did you have a question? What is gum? What are we chewing? Well, we may be chewing the natural rubber from, from a tree, and you might be fine with that. But it most of the um the gums that you see especially in the regular supermarket the gum base can be made from other things and you can google this from you know fda gum base and just see for yourself what's allowed to be used one of them is um a rubber called it's a butyl rubber and um i looked it up and i was just shocked when i looked you know what is this where else is it used and it's used in the tire of cars tires I don't want to be chewing a tire, but you're probably saying, come on, I can't chew a tire. Right, you can't chew a tire, it's too hard. So what do they do? Well, if you look up that gum base FDA, like I mentioned, you'll notice that um, they use plasticizers. So they take the tire, the rubber that goes into tires, and they add plasticizers to make it more chewy. So now you, chew, now you can chew on the tire. Um, so, you know, should we swallow the gum? I remember that question growing up. Probably not, because I don't want to be chewing a tire and swallowing it. Um, so what else about, about the gum? 
Well, what's problematic to me, I'm going to take this gum, for example. This comes from a woman named Julie that came to a presentation that I gave down in, um, in Orlando, Florida. She gave up her gum on the spot, and this, this is it. And what I find really shocking about this is that there are several uh, sugar alcohols in there. Sugar alcohols, in my previous class, we spoke about them. They tend to end in I-T-O-L, like xylitol, maltitol, um, sorbitol, and these, these sugar alcohols can be disruptive to the stomach. So there are several uh, sugar alcohols, xylitol, maltitol, mannitol, and then uh, there's more maltitol a little further down. What's also interesting, there's soy lecithin in here, there's artificial flavors, artificial colors, and then there are four, count them, four artificial sugars. So besides the sugar alcohol, there are artificial sugars in here. And lo and behold, there's that maltodextrin too. So gum is sort of a cesspool for your mouth. That's how I look at it. Um, and I really think that you might want to consider giving up the gum. Now, for some people, aspartame has been associated with headaches. So Julie, when she gave up her gum, we stayed in touch. And she actually had headaches her whole adult life that have gone away since, get, since giving up the gum. Now, who knows? Is it the artificial sugars? Is it the chewing motion? A combo of that? We're not sure, but she gave up the gum. The headaches went away. Now, it's just at Atlanta at speaking at a um, fitness conference, and there was a lovely guy named Richard in the audience. And Richard, um, a, a participant there, what he said is that he gave up gum and his headaches went away. So he, you know, brought that story with him and it was just, you know, when we were talking about the gum and he said, oh, I want to share what happened to me. So I thought that's kind of interesting, but there's a lot of really unsavory ingredients in gum. Well, how do you give up the gum? What Julie did is she drank more, more water and that was really helpful to have more, um, you know, more water in the diet anyway, but she replaced the gum with water. The first few days were tough because like any habit, it's hard when you're trying to do something new. But wow, imagine that her headaches have gone away. So I think that's pretty, pretty fascinating stuff. Now let's talk about some other gums. And this is going to be really shocking to you because it was to me. Um, one of them is xanthan gum. And xanthan gum is in so many products now. When I was down in... Um, in Atlanta, I went to a popular supermarket that's a healthier type of supermarket. And in there, I wanted to find salad dressing because I wanted to buy a salad. And every single salad dressing they had in this healthier type of supermarket had xanthan gum in it. This one has xanthan gum. Xanthan gum is now in hummus. It's in cheese. It, it's even in deodorant. It is just, it, it is everywhere. And do we have a question, what is this stuff? Well, it's made from the same bacteria that causes rot on broccoli and cauliflower. Pretty disgusting, right? Well, what's even worse is that xanthan gum, actually, you take, the way you get that is that you feed bacteria sh you, sugar, and then the bacteria oozes this slime. And then you take the slime and you dry it out and you use isopropyl alcohol. You know that stuff that says flammable, there's warnings on it and CVS when you go shopping. They use that um, to precipitate the, that slime. And then the slime is turned into a powder and then the food companies buy that powder and then they use it in, in your product. So it's a, again, a thickener and emulsifier and a stabilizing agent. Well, I haven't found that um, a lot of evidence yet that it's bad for us. However, um, I have seen that people report on various sites just having intestinal comfort that they discomfort, intestinal discomfort that they attribute to the xanthan gum. So if your stomach is bothering you, start looking at what you're eating. I try to avoid it at all costs. And I found, I do taste tests in some of my classes where I have organic hummus without xanthan gum and hummus with xanthan gum. And the hummus without that xanthan gum tastes so much better. Same thing, I'm Italian, grew up with ricotta cheese. And ricotta cheese just has a few simple ingredients. And now I noticed the ricotta cheese of today, they're adding all these gums and it tastes different than it used to. Why, we don't need all that stuff. Um, so let's get back to basics. And I'm glad to see that some of the popular ricotta companies, or ricotta, however you pronounce it, um, 
it, they, they are now making um, a more natural type of that cheese that doesn't have the gums added. But most of the stuff does have the gums. So you have to check, check your labels. Um, let's move on to another gum. Oh, the other thing I like to, to, to mention is that with these gums, if you went to a pick your own farm or you wanted to just start growing some things in your garden, you can't grow xanthan gum. So that's kind of a good indication. If I can't grow it myself, maybe I don't want to eat it. And there might be some exceptions to that rule like probiotics, but um, I think, uh, you know, I'm trying to stay away from, from this stuff. The next one is going to be shocking to some of you, especially those that are eating really healthy and you love your almond milk. Well, in almond milk, I used to buy it too, and I liked it. It tastes yummy, but I kept seeing this gel and gum in every brand. Like, what is this gel and gum? Can you buy it somewhere? Can you grow it? Well, I started to dig a little bit deeper, and I found that it's similar to that pesky xanthan gum. So gel and gum is a secretion from a bacteria, and it is dried with the isopropyl alcohol, again, the same kind that has the warnings that you buy you know, at the drugstore, that isopropyl alcohol that has that nasty smell to it. Um, so it's basically, they say, purified by um, recovery with isopropyl alcohol. So that slime from the bacteria is recovered with the isopropyl alcohol, and then it's turned into literally a, a, a powder. And that's why, you know, you read that, uh, we talked earlier that some ingredients might need um, soy lecithin, some powders, because it helps to decrease that, that clumping. Um, what annoys me is that there is, residuals are allowed. So the USDA says that the residual for humans not to exceed 0.075% in food eaten by humans. But for pets, it, um, that residual is higher, it's 0.4%. And that kind of bothers me because pets are smaller than us, but they're allowed to have more of this residual in their food. So you might want to look at gel and gum and see if it's in your pet food. And um, you know, that might be something that, that we, we don't want to have in there. All right, let's, um, let's move on and just chat a little bit. I have another fun thing to show you, and then we'll do our, um, our, our recipe. So I want to show you um, a food that has an ingredient called carmine. When I say carmine, what do you think of? I happen to think of that really lovely guy from Laverne and Shirley. Do you all remember him? He's a really nice guy. I think they call him the big ragu. Well, do you know what carmine is? I'm going to tell you what it is. It happens to be in a yogurt here. And you look in the label, you go through it, and you see carmine, and your eyes can almost glaze over that because it doesn't stand out. It doesn't really sound like a chemical, but do you know what it is? It's actually the red exoskeleton of a bug. A bug. Can you imagine that? And it's in here. Why is it in here? Well, to give this the red coloring that's in the fruit. So it's better to get your yogurt, like this is a lovely yogurt, a Faye Total Greek yogurt. Get your yogurt plain and add real fruit, natural fruit to it. You don't need to add the color to it then. And then you don't, you know, they often will add sugar when they add, uh, when they add fruit to, to products. So carmine is added there and that, you know what, it's protein. So maybe you don't mind eating the exoskeleton of a red bug. But it's good to know that it's in there because maybe you're vegan and you don't want to eat anything that has eyes or came from, uh, you know, something that has eyes. So, um, you know, just something good to know. Again, that is carmine. All right, so let's move along and I am going to show you a recipe. And this recipe, is, I like to call Truly Chewy. And these Truly Chewies that we're going to make today and if you think about it, I showed you those Oreos and I showed you um, some other products that, uh, that have chocolate in them, like the M&Ms. And sometimes we might be craving something chocolatey and then we eat that stuff, we kind of feel lousy, not too great. What I find when I eat these, I just feel good. And I like to eat these mindfully. They're not very big and they have about roughly 100 to 110 calories in them for about an ounce that we're going to make and I'll show you that. So what you do is you, you have your blender and you take a cup of pecans and a cup of dates. So I already have my dates measured out. These are pitted dates. Sometimes the pitted dates still have like a little bit of stem on top. You want to pull that stem off. So we're going to put in the pitted dates 
and then we're going to put in a cup of almonds and let me just I think there's a just a piece of that top of the stem there okay we're going to put in the almonds just a cup all right and then we're going to put in one eighth teaspoon of sea salt and then we're going to put in um, fourth teaspoon of vanilla extract And then we are going to put in a fourth cup of Hershey's cocoa. And then we are going to mix this together and we're going to slowly add a little bit of water along the way, just little bits to make it moist enough because we're going to roll this together. Take a little look. It's still kind of powdery. I'm going to add some more water to it. And all right, let's add a little, little, let it go a little bit longer. that is looking pretty good so what we're going to do and you can see it right there um, we're going I'm gonna put gloves on for this because some of our live uh, participants that are watching today are going to be eating this shortly but at home you can roll this with your own uh, hands so we're going to take one of these take the blade out we're going to take some of the dough and we roll it together. So you roll it into a ball. And then you take hemp seeds. So I'm going to put that ball there. You take hemp seeds, which are right over here. Actually, I'm just going to leave my gloves on for this. And I'm going to sprinkle the hemp seeds whoops, over it and then continue to roll it in the head. So it's almost like a meatball. Continue to roll it in the seed. And then what you do is you put these in your freezer. And then when you're ready, you take them out of the freezer and you just eat them. You eat them mindfully. So when I eat this mindfully, I want to get five or six or more bites out of it. Enjoy every bit. It's going to taste like a nice brownie bite. Um, so again, you're going to put these, you're going to roll them all up, roll them in the hemp seed, and then put them in your um, freezer and then enjoy. And what I'm going to do is put this recipe up on my website for you. So that's www.trishasilverman.com. Dot com, and then you go to my blog, and I will put that recipe up for you. And I want you to enjoy. It's really yummy, and it's a really nice indulgence to have. So, folks, that's all we have for today. I hope you enjoyed the show. And I do want you to think about what I mentioned before. I want you to get dividends on the investment in time that you spent with me today. So maybe now you'll look more at your labels and you'll think more before you eat. So thank you very much, everyone, and see you next time. Bye-bye.